about Israel. Uh, when you go to Israel, it really makes the Bible come alive. I'm so thankful that uh, God opened the door for me to get to go. It's kind of been a lifelong dream of mine, but raising three boys that played every sport in the world, um, and we were so active in everything they did, you know, it just, the time never really presented itself until uh, now. And, uh, you know, it kind of came about because Jared's working at Valleydale, and Mac Brunson, the pastor there, is the one that planned this trip. And he said, Jared, I need you to go and video me as I preach, you know, because I'm going to preach on the Sea of Galilee, and we're going to send it back. And so Jared called me up and said that he's going to Israel, got a, that he's get, getting a free trip. He said, do your mom want to go? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, if, if we can get us in, we'll go. So it kind of happened quickly. And uh, but it, it did work out. It was fun getting to go with him, and um, I'm just so thankful. Uh, I think I'll be a lot better preacher uh, in the days ahead. You know, just seeing it all, it just it, it all makes a lot more sense. You know, it, it, it's amazing how small Israel is. I mean, it's about the size of New Jersey. You know, it's it's not a big place, and. You think about all the things that happened in the Bible right there. I mean, in that very small geographical thing that, if, that, that has affected the whole world throughout history happened right there, right there around the Sea of Galilee, which really is a lake. I mean, the Sea of Galilee is, is, is Lake Tiberias. You know, it's, it's not really a, a sea. It's a big lake. But I mean, is it salt water? no, it's fresh water. It yeah, water. it's a fresh water lake. And then you got the sea, the Dead Sea, which is yeah. really salt water. I mean, it's it's all salt water. You can't even you know you can't sink in it. And the Dead Sea is is on the other side, and uh, and and everything happened right there. You know, between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. You know, and. Um, and it's all right there, and, and, and it's just amazing. Um, Israel's beautiful. I mean, you really don't realize how beautiful it is. We, we came at, a, at probably the most beautiful time right after the rains, and so everything was green and luscious. Uh, every kind of fruit tree you can imagine, uh, every kind of crop you can imagine. You know what's interesting is when the Palestinians had the land for all those years, it was swampland. I mean, a almost all of Israel was swamps. It wasn't, you know, it was just swampland. Yeah, it was, a lot of it was desert, and then the other part of it was swampland. And so the Palestinians were like, why does Israel want this land so bad? <laughs> and then when Israel finally got control of it, they, uh, they cleaned out all those swamps. And our guide was telling us that they had the most number of deaths from malaria that has ever happened from all the mosquitoes of people that were cleaning out those swamps. So they did have a lot of, but once they cleaned those swamps out, they turned it into the most luscious. You see, God had told them, I'm giving you a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Mm -hmm. And when the Palestinians had it, it didn't look like that was true. It looked like it was just swamp land. Who would want swamp land? But then when Israel got the land, if you go to it now, it is a land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, almost every part of it, they've turned it into uh, fruitfulness and productiveness, and it is absolutely gorgeous. But it didn't become that until it got into the hands of the one that God promised it to. Isn't that, isn't that just like God? Yeah, it's kind of like the same with our lives, right? Without God, we're like swamps, right? We're just dirty swamps. And then when we come to Christ, He, he produces... Uh, this incredible fruit in our lives. And, um, and so, you know, I, th I think the most moving things about Israel to me uh, was, you know, seeing the, the weeping, the wailing wall, you know, the West Wall, where the, the Jews are weeping over the fact that they have no temple and that they have no Messiah. You know, they don't know they have a Messiah. They don't believe that Christ is a Messiah. 
And it's been all these years. And they stick their nose in that wall. They just put their nose in the wall and they weep and wail over the fact that they have no temple. And they don't realize that right here's the temple. We're the temple. You know, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that Christ is the Messiah. And it's so sad. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. And there was a synagogue right there um, by the Wailing Wall, right under it, uh, under that wall, there's a Jewish synagogue. You know, you got the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim mosque up there on the Temple Mount, but they're in the, the West Wall, which is really the only piece of wall of the old temple that's remaining. So that West Wall, the lower part of it, those lower stones is the only part of, of Herod's temple. That was, and so that's why they go to that wall, because that's the only piece of the temple they have left. And the, the Muslim dome of the rock, that big golden dome, is sitting on the temple mount where, they, where the temple was built. And, and so you see the darkness of that Muslim religion. We were there during Ramadan, and just the oppressive nature of the Muslim religion, you know, how they treat women, and it's just a dark, evil religion, really. And, and then you have the Jews that are lost. You know, they're still hoping that they're going to get a temple and they can start back their rituals. And, and in the synagogue, their worship is just chanting. They kind of, they still, they put the phylacteries on their head still. And it's just all the same ritual religion. There's no heart in it. It's just they're going through the motions. And so, you know, that was moving in the, in the fact that, I, you know, okay, right across the Kindred, Kindred Valley on the Mount of Olives is where Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. There's a church there now where He wept. And if you go there, I mean, you're, He's looking right at the temple. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not far. I mean, He's looking. And you, and, and you can imagine why He wept. And, and, I, and you want to weep when you look at that and you see false religion of the Muslims and you see the dead religion of the Jews and it makes you want to weep, you know. And so, so I felt it. You know, I felt like weeping with Jesus, you know. Just And then there's two different sites for the um, place they think that Jesus was crucified and where He was buried. And one of those is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where the Catholics have built this elaborate church and this monument where, the, where they think the tomb was. And you go to that and it's just boisterous and busy and loud and so many people just bumping into each other. And, you know, there's this huge line trying to get into the temple and into, the, into the, uh, what they think is the tomb. And, um, you know, it's, it's not what you would think it would be, you know. But the other place that they think the, um, that Christ may have been crucified in the tomb is called Gordon's Calvary in the Garden Tomb. And, I mean, this is where, in all my research, I believe this is it. And I'll tell you why I believe it's it, because there is this rock that is called Golgotha. It looks like a skull. It's got eyes. And it's ominous. It's not as ominous now as it was back before erosion has kind of eroded the nose off of it and everything. But if you look at some of the pictures back years ago, I mean, it looks like a skull. And of course, the Bible says that Jesus was crucified on Golgotha, the place of the skull. And I'm like, well, I mean, okay, this sure looks like a skull. And, and, uh, and then right by the place of the skull, there's a garden, and there was a tomb that's hewn in rock, a, a, a rich man's tomb that was literally cut into the rock, Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus wasn't buried in a, in a cave. He was buried in a 
tomb of a rich man. And so that tomb is there, which makes sense. And when you go there, it's nothing like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's no Catholic monuments. It's just all natural. You know, there's this beautiful garden, and it's, everybody's quiet. Everybody's reverent. And we, we took communion there. We, we got to all, very orderly, one group at a time, just to go in the tomb. And I was in there, guys. I looked. He's not there, all right? It's, it's still empty, all right? And, uh, and, uh, and then the coolest thing was there were different uh, nationalities there. There was a group from India. There was a group from Africa. There was a group from Italy. And, and they're all, they all they're in that garden, they've set up little different places. And, you know, you would hear them singing praise songs. And even though you couldn't uh, he, understand the words, you, could, you knew what they were singing because you, you, you could hear the tune. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so all these nationalities were worshiping Jesus. And it was so different mm -hmm. than the dead religion that was over there, you know, and uh, and so that was that was very moving. That was my favorite part of the trip, no doubt. That being at uh, Galgotha and that garden tomb, and being able to walk into the tomb and you know see that that uh, you know Jesus was there at one time, and so so many other things. You know, I could probably talk to you all all night, uh, but uh, but anyway. Uh, yeah. If we pray for our country, we also need to pray for what's happening in Israel. Yes. With their government. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we saw a little bit of that. Um, like one, one bridge, there were people on the bridge waving flags. It's, it seemed mostly peaceful. You know, their protest, were, while we were there anyway, it, it seemed... Mostly peaceful. They were saying um, the airport's closed. You're never getting back. You wouldn't believe yeah, we what people were saying. Be able to even come home. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think there was one day that the airport's closed, uh, but that wasn't the day we were flying home. But uh, so, thank you for praying. But I, I think I think it's kind of settled some, although there's you know still some of that going on, but. Uh, we didn't see a lot of that. I think our tour guides knew, you know, where not to go. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we felt very safe the whole time we were there. We went over into Jordan, and, you know, that's different. You're more in the Palestinian area. Uh, but we, st we felt safe the whole time we were there. You know, we had great guides, and we were in a big group. And Are they knowledgeable, the tour guides? Very. Yeah, that's what so. Extremely. I learned so much. And in listening to this guy, you would have thought he was a Christian. I mean, he was very kind, gentle man, typical Jew, taught like a Jew. Yeah, he, he reminded me, if you ever seen uh, Fiddler on the Roof, he reminded me of that guy. You know, he taught like that guy, and he had that sweet demeanor about him. Um, and he, he knew all about Jesus. He knew all about... And he, I mean, you could tell he loves his country. He loves... But he's not a believer. And I'm like, what? I mean, how, how can you know all this? And he basically, somebody asked him, and he basically said that over here, no, you know, not, not, none of us are believers. You know, that there's just not many believers there. I mean, there are a few uh, Orthodox, um, you know, they're, they, they're Orthodox Jews and they're secular. And most of them are secular. And by secular... That means that they're they don't really practice a lot. They're they're Jewish and they love their country, but they're not practicing a lot of the religion. The the uh, the Orthodox Jews are the ones that have the hats and the black coats and the hair that's different and you know things like that. So ma majority of them are secular, but very few of them are Messianic Jews over there. There are very few. So I think it's just hard for them to... I don't know if they don't believe... I think it's hard for them not to believe. I just think there's so much pressure for them not to believe. Because if they did believe, it would 
create so many difficulties in their family and things. So I don't know, it was heartbreaking that he's not a Christian because he's so smart and he knows. And I mean, if you were listening to him, you'd think, oh, this guy's a Christian because, I mean. why we have to go to the Word. We yeah. We just take somebody's, uh, just what they're telling us. Right. Because they can be knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They can know who he is and still not know him. That's right. They can know all that head knowledge. It's just like what Paul, when he, when he expressed his burden for the Jewish people, um, he said they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You know, and you, you saw that. Um, we went to the Temple Institute, which was interesting. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your socks off. But uh, we're at the Temple Institute, and... Those guys have made everything for the rebuilding of the temple. I mean, they, they, have, they have rebuilt every artifact, even the golden menorah. They've got a golden menorah that is two tons of gold. It's worth so many millions of dollars, and they've built that for the temple. They've got all the priestly garments, all the everything. They're ready. You know, they, they, they want to build the temple. They've got the resources to build the temple. Um, but they feel like they can't build the temple as long as that Dome of the Rock is there. They feel like they've got to build it there on the Dome of the Rock. So they're waiting. They're, that's why they go to the Wailing Wall, you know, and wail over the fact that they, they want to build their temple. But at the end, now we're sitting here listening to this with our two ears, Okay. And, uh, and at the end of this, that, that, you know, they, they, you go from room to room and there's a, a speaker and a guy is pointing you to this and telling you what they built and showing you all the artifacts that they're ready. And then at the end of this, they sa he said this. I promise you he said this. He said, and we now know where the Ark of the Covenant is. And we are ready to get it when the temple is built. And I'm like, did I just hear that? I said, Rondi, did you just hear what I... Because I have not heard that. Yeah. I've never heard anybody say that they know where it is, but they said that. I even asked Pastor Mac at Valleydale. I said, have you heard this? He said, no, he hadn't heard that. So that, that may be something new they've added, but I mean, they said emphatically, we know where it is and that we're ready to bring it when the temple is rebuilt. So I was shocked by that. But anyway, I thought that, thought that might be interesting to you because I had never heard anybody say that they know where it is, you know, until... Is there room next to the, the dome to build the temple? Or is that all congested? No, they've got to build it on that rock where Abraham yeah. offered Isaac. Yeah. See, that's... The temple was built on the very altar where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, and then God provided the lamb, which again, how do you not see Jesus in that? Yeah. But that's where the temple was built, and that means something to the Muslims too, because they claim Abraham as their father. So they built that, that uh, Dome of the Rock, that, that Muslim mosque there, uh, mosque. So they feel like that they can't build anywhere else, that it's got to be built on that rock. And until... They're just saying that one of these days we believe God's going. They just trust. They believe that one of these days God's going to intervene and open the door for that. Uh, and I think so too. I think it's going to happen uh, during you know the tribulations. What I think. But so is the is the thought that the Antichrist will bridge a treaty between the Jews and the Muslims to allow that to happen? Is that what the general idea is? Just curious. I mean, that's not my general idea. I think, I think God. I think it's going to happen by a divine act, either an earthquake or. It's got to be getting rid of somehow. Or may, or maybe they're going to shoot a, maybe the Arabs are going to shoot a bomb over into Israel. And it's going, <laughs> they're going to aim wrong, and it's going to hit their own mosque. I mean, you know, I, something, you know. I just, I think, I don't know how it's going to happen either. Yeah. I just think God's somehow going to sovereignly oh, 
create that, that opportunity. Because, I mean, they know if, if they did it themselves, it would be World War III. Mm -hmm. And isn't that amazing that it would be World War III? Yeah. Because this little tiny place over there, no bigger than New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Center of the universe. The still, after all these years, the center of the universe. Yeah. So I'm just curious, did you ask him where is the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> well... It was a voice on a uh, on an intercom. It wasn't. There was nobody in the room. You go you go from room to room, and when, and they you sit in chairs, and then there's a audio voice, and there'll be like a light come on over here, and they'll talk about these artifacts, and then a light over here, and a light over here, and so in the very last room we went into. Um, they said th the final thing was, and we know now where the Ark of Covenant is, and we're ready to retrieve it when the, yeah, it was it was a big wow. All of us in the room were kind of like, wow. I mean, none of us had heard anybody say that before. Does it say that they have accumulated all the materials? Oh, yeah, yeah. all of them. Yeah, that's been known for years. Yeah. yeah, and they've rebuilt and accumulated everything that they need. So, I mean, they're ready. Just like that. They're, they're sitting on ready. Well, and I've read that they're even training some of the priests to know. They said that. They have trained the priests, the core, core, whatever those people are. They're ready. They've trained them. So, so every, I mean, they're set. All, they, all they're waiting on is the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. That was fascinating. I bet so. Wow. Yeah. Called the Temple Institute. <laughs> I mean, it must have been new because nobody told me they ever heard somebody say we know. So that must have been an added, added recently. Yeah. Called the Temple Institute is where that was. The, the Temple Institute. Okay. Yeah. So it. And it's right there in the Temple area. Wow. Yeah. Well, could you? I'm just sitting there thinking. Could you imagine the? actual Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat. All yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That you actually get eye, your eyeballs on it. And just how... We're not supposed to, though. We're not the high yeah. priest. <laughs> better be no. careful with it. You better be careful how you move it. Yeah. Who's going to go get it? You know? <laughs> Who's going to go get it? <laughs> Yeah. They better move it on the right way, right? They better use those poles and not put yeah. it on a cart. Yeah. yeah. Put it on a wagon. I don't know, guys. That was fascinating to me. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted by that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. When we went to see his only son, so we know where, that, where it's the temple's supposed to be. Yeah. We saw it. Yeah. They showed the cross being on that where Abraham... In that movie. Oh, well, we saw the, we saw the altar. Right. Well, see, another reason that I believe that uh, Gordon's Calvary is the true place of Calvary is because that is a continuation of Mount Moriah. So Mount Moriah is the mountain where Abraham offered Isaac and the the temples built on the alt, on the very spot where they think the altar is, but that rock it's a rock mountain. It keeps going, and Gordon's Calvary is a part of Mount Moriah, which would make sense. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is not a part of that. It's closer in uh, to the temple. Um, it's even inside the walls now but it because it says Jesus was crucified outside the walls but I think that back then where the church of the holy sepulcher is it was outside the walls but Gordon's Calvary is definitely outside the walls what's interesting too you know the way that the reason why the church of the holy sepulcher doesn't carry a lot of uh, credibility with me is because um, it was Constantine, you know, in 360 when Constantine, the Roman <laughs> emperor, was saved and he said that, well, all of Rome's going to be saved and, 
you know, we're going to make Christianity the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire. Well, it, it was his mother, he Helen, Helena, who decided she wanted to go back and discover the place where Christ was crucified, where the tomb was. So, see, that was three hundred and not that was three hundred and sixty years after. So that's a long time. Well, so when she went back, there were some that said we think it's here, there. So they they started digging and they found three crosses. And so they said, well, this must be the place. But they're like, well, how do we know if these are the crosses? And so they took one cross and brought a sick person in. They touched the sick person with one of the crosses. And yeah, that's a Catholic. And it didn't do anything. And then they took a second cross and touched him. It doing. Then they did a third one and touched the sick person. Supposedly he got well. So they said, oh, so this is it. So I'm like, oh, I don't, I'm, not, this, I'm not sure about this. But when you go to Gordon's Calvary, you look at the skull and you tell me, is that the place of the skull? I mean, wow, I think it is. So anyway, yeah. Well, what about the road that he walks with a twist across? Is it going... Yeah, the Via Della Rosa goes to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Oh, okay. So um, it, it might not be the road if, if it's Gordon's Calvary. So it would, have, it would have been that road if it was going to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. But that's all. And they've got different stations where supposedly this happened and this happened, but you don't know. They don't know all that. Yeah. Just to know the yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Rondy, that picture of Rondi kissing the ground. Yeah. This is why. I think I'd have to do that too. I have to yeah. Prostrate. I have to lay yeah. prostrate. Everybody walk over me. <laughs> There's not many places where you're actually walking on that road because, you know, it's been built over so many yeah. times. Most of it is way, most of the road that he walked on is way down underneath mm -hmm. different levels of building. But that part that Rondi kissed was where archaeologists had dug down to the original road. And so our guide told us that this road is the road that Jesus would have walked on. So that's why Rondi kissed that road. Because she said, okay, this is the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you see her ride the camel? Yes. Did you see how happy she was to get off that camel? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that are the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane are they that old or are they newer trees? There are trees that are very old there. Now, they said some of them might go back that far, but I don't know if they know for sure. But they're old. They're you know there was one tree that was a thorn tree. And had those big thorns that they said it would have been the thorns that they used to, you know, stick in Jesus' head. So. Was it emotional being on the Sea of Galilee? That was fun because um, Pastor Mac of, of Valleydale found a guy who has built a, an exact replica. They found they found archaeologists found a boat that dated back to the time of, of Christ. And so it was a boat like the one that Jesus and the disciples would have been in. So the, this guy has built an exact replica. He, he took it and so we rented that. So this guy took us out on this boat that was an exact replica and Pastor Mac preached and Rondi and I got to be in there with him because Jared was video and it was windy. I mean, the, ro the wind is blowing the the boat is rocking and Jared my son let me brag let me brag on Jared I mean he did an amazing job uh, he I mean he he had a microphone that cut all the wind out and it, it, people at Valley are amazed that, at how incredible and Jared even flew his drone and 
you know, he, and, Jared, and Jared said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my drone out, and it's so windy it may go right into the lake. So y'all don't feel sorry for me. He said, if it goes into the lake, I don't want y'all coming up and feeling sorry for me. So, so he got the drone out, and it just went straight up, and he was able to get a picture of that boat, if you've seen it. So you can see that boat because he got the drone out. And then the funniest thing was Jared trying to land that drone because he had to land it back in the boat with the boat moving and the wind blowing. And, I mean, he's, he's doing this number, but he pulled it off. I mean, he landed it right back in the boat, and we were just like, wow, you know. So, uh, so that was... Uh, it's probably about as far from me to the back wall back there and it's it's you know I got a v-shaped hull it's got a you know a canopy on it and it's made of solid wood and so yeah if you go if you go to my uh, Facebook site I think I have some pictures of it and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was cool being out there on the lake, on the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, yeah. How many stops on your flight? Was it a direct flight or did you have to make stops? Or? No, we flew into Frankfurt, and that was about a 10-hour flight, and then we had about a four-hour flight from Frankfurt to Tel Aviv. So it wasn't too bad. You know, the 10-hour one... You get kind of stove up, you know, it's a little long, but, um, you know, it, it wasn't bad. Coming back, you know, we were very tired. You have that time change on the way back, and so Monday I was wiped out, but after one day of catching up, I was fine. If I didn't have this sinus thing going on, I'd, you know, getting that made it even a little harder, you what know. What was the time difference? Seven hours, I think. Yeah. So when we'd be out in the day, it'd be nighttime here, and so. The next day, or the the next day daytime, or the day or the same day daytime. The day next day. day. It depends on what time it is. <laughs> so. You fly at night, and you're there the next day. Yeah. So when we were flying back, you know, we we were gaining time back. Okay. You know. Okay. Okay. So even though it took, you know, 14 hours, we gained like seven of those back. So right now it's um, tomorrow morning. Over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any other? Any other questions? Well, tonight, um, just going to read a, a quick scripture and give you a, a few thoughts. And then next week, we'll get back into finishing up the book of Daniel. But um, I wanted to read from 1 Corinthians 15 and um, talk, talk about the beauty of the gospel. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and He appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some of them have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy, to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, 
though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And so, here in 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the most powerful and clear statements from Paul of the beauty of the gospel. And, and the, the things that I see in it is, the first thing is just the simplicity of the gospel. You know, Paul said that, you know, this is the gospel that I preached. And this is the gospel that we stand on. You know, that nobody is going to change our mind. We stand. And this is the gospel by which we are being saved if you truly believe and your, your faith is real. It's not in vain if you truly believe. So he's saying, you know, that you can't have that demon-like belief that you just believe in God in the head, but it's got to be the gospel saves if your faith is real, if it's a genuine faith. And then just the simplicity of it. He said, here's the gospel that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day. I mean, that's the gospel. I mean, that's the beautiful simplicity of the gospel. If somebody says, what's the gospel? Well, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and He rose again on the third day. And, you know, every piece of that is important. You know, if Christ had not died for our sins on the cross, none of us in this room would have a chance to be in heaven. We'd have to pay for our own sins in a place called hell. I mean, all of us. And there's no amount of good works that could ever afford us heaven. And so Christ had to do what He did. He had to carry that cross up the hill and die on that cross for our sins. And He did that of His own free will because He loves us. He loves you. He would have done it just for you. And He did it for all of us. And He had to be buried, you know, because He was dead. What do you do with a dead person? You bury them. So, so the fact that He was buried was the, the absolute proof that He was a dead man. He wasn't just wounded. He wasn't just sleeping. He wasn't just swooning. You know, he was truly a dead man. I mean, he, all the life was out of him. And so he was buried. And then he rose again. After being dead, he came back to life again. And without that, I mean, how would we know that he was any different than any other prophet that's dead? I mean, he would be no different than Mohammed. Or we'd still be lost. We would still be lost. I mean, uh, so all those three components of the gospel, his death, his burial, his resurrection, are important, but how simple. I mean, that is the beauty and the simplicity of the gospel. We are saved because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we believe in him with genuine childlike faith and trust him. And we are forgiven. And then we see the proof of the gospel. So Paul said that, uh, that he, there were many eyewitnesses of, of the resurrection. First he appeared to Cephas. That was Peter. And, you know, Peter had denied Jesus three times. And, and Jesus went to Peter and, and restored Peter. And then he went to... Um, uh, after Cephas, he went to the twelve. And that would have been the twelve minus Judas, but with Matthias. Because Matthias had been, you know, kind of brought in as that apostle, that, that disciple that replaced Judas. He was the backup guy. And so he appeared to them. Remember, he went into the room where, where the doors were closed and he appeared. And, uh, and, and he said, put your, you know, hands... In, my, in, my, in the holes in my hands and touch my side. And he appeared to them. And, um, and then it says he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And that we don't really know. I mean, the Bible doesn't give us any information on when that happened. So we don't know when he appeared to the 500. But perhaps... You know, they were the 500 that were a part of the, the larger crowd of disciples that followed him. You know, we know there was a larger crowd than the 12. 
there were a lot of women and there were others and, and maybe he had a time of meeting with them because he lived for 40 days before he ascended back to heaven. But what's interesting about that is Paul says that many of them are still alive. He said many of these 500 are still alive today. So, so that is important because when he wrote this letter and he's saying that these were eyewitnesses of Christ, people could say, really? I don't believe that. Well, he could say, well, these 500 are still alive. Let, let, me, let me give you their tech. You can te- send them a text message and ask them, you know. Why, why don't you go over there and, and visit with them? So he's saying, you know, what he's saying is, you know, I'm not just making this up. These people are still alive. So if you want to go ask them, you know, let me give you some of their names. And, and you go ask them. So that, that was important. So these 500 were still living, many of them, although some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James. And, and that James, we, we, we believe, is, his, is the half-brother of Jesus. And a lot of people think that up until this point, James had not been a believer. You know, his brothers didn't believe in him. And, and many people think that it wasn't until Jesus went to his brother that J- James put his faith in him. And James went on to become the James that was the leading pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And, and so he, he became a very significant leader. And then he said, last of all, you know, he appeared to me um, as an apostle who was un, un, untimely born. So when did he appear to Paul? When he was on the road to Damascus, right? And he, he, was, he was not a believer at the time. He was a persecutor of the church. And, and, and so the, the simplicity of the gospel is backed up by the, the proof, by the witnesses of the gospel. I mean, they were eyewitnesses. The resurrection was seen by all these people. And, you know, the interesting thing about the disciples is that ten of them died a martyr's death. You know, Judas, of course, committed suicide. John the beloved disciple who wrote the book of Revelation is the only one who was not martyred, although they tried to martyr him, but they eventually couldn't kill him because God wasn't ready for him to die. And he got put on an island of, of, with prisoners and he wrote the book of Revelation. But the other ten all died a martyr's death. And all ten of them went to their death professing the risen Christ, which if they were making this story up. You know, if they, were, if they made it up, I mean, there's no way they would have all been willing to give their life for a lie, you know. And so that there's more eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ than, you know, any other miraculous event that we can imagine. So, you know, Christ is risen, the tomb is empty, and then we see the grace of the gospel. Uh, the beautiful grace of the gospel is in the words of Paul. And uh, he said, For I am the least of the apostles. He said, verse 9, Unworthy to be called an apostle. And he always felt that way. I mean, you read him kind of refer to that. He, he never got over the fact that at one time he was a persecutor. And he felt like he was so unworthy to for him to be saved and for God to call him to do what he did. He said, I'm unworthy because I persecuted the church. But I love verse 10. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I mean, and and wouldn't that be all of our testimony here tonight? Don't we all kind of feel like Paul were unworthy to be saved? But by the grace of God, we are what we are. You know, we're here tonight. We're saved. We're, we're celebrating because of the grace of God. And he said, um, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. But on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, it was the grace of God that is in me. Whether then it is I or they, so we preach and so you believe. And so Paul did. He went on to work harder than anybody. 
I mean, I can't imagine anybody that accomplished more in a lifetime than the Apostle Paul and all the missionary journeys he went on and all the people he led to Christ. And all that was motivated, though, not by law. It was motivated by grace, right? He didn't do all that so that he would be saved. He did that because he was saved. And he was so grateful for what he had experienced that he worked harder than anybody. So we work, our works, we're not, we, we're not working for our salvation. We work because we've been saved and out of gratitude for all that God has done for us. And Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. What that meant. Yeah. Peter, yeah. Had yeah. Just been with him. I, I just, that just yeah. shows God's love. Yeah. That just shows his love no matter what we do. Yeah. He loves us so yeah. much. Yeah. And he went to James, yeah. who had been ugly to him and yeah. a brother that had denied him. Yeah. That's the grace of And he went to Paul. You know, we see him going after these people, and that is the amazing grace of God. So, uh, just a little Easter devotional to uh, kind of set our hearts for this Sunday and Good Friday. And let's thank God for the gospel of grace. And then next Sunday, um, I'm going to kick off a brand new, speaking of Peter, I'm going to kick off a new sermon series called Like a Rock, The Spiritual Journey of Simon Peter. So we are going to take Simon Peter's life and cover it from beginning to end. What, what I, I'm excited about this series because of all the people in the Bible I think that we identify with, we can all identify with Peter, you know, because Peter was not perfect, right? He, he made a lot of mistakes, and he would have moments where he did good, wonderful things, and then, boy, right after that he would do something... Yeah, and, and so I just I think Peter's a fascinating person in the relationship of Christ with Peter. Peter had all this leadership potential, and God and Jesus knew it. He knew there was a rock in that guy somewhere, but it took a long time to polish that rock, right? And so we're we're gonna we're gonna look at that whole journey. We're gonna spend the spring and the summer kind of going through a biographical study of scripture of different events in the life of Peter. I'm, I'm really looking forward uh, to it, and we'll kick that off right after Easter. We'll, we've got a card promoting that to all of our one-timers that come once a year and try to, try to say, hey, come back next Sunday, you know, come and, come and be a part of this series. So um, pray that my voice gets well, all right? Let's pray. Father, what a good time tonight to talk about uh, Israel, to talk about Jerusalem, your holy city. As our guide said, it's the most important city on earth, and it truly is. You not only died there, not only rose from the grave there, but the Bible says you're coming back there, you know, that your feet will land on the Mount of Olives. God, that's where you're returning. and So it is the most important city on earth. And even though it seems like a very obscure place, the whole world revolves around it, and it's truly amazing. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gospel, the simplicity of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We will celebrate that Sunday, and we pray, God, that you'll bring many people from around the area and that we'll make much of Jesus, that we'll sing, that we'll celebrate and that we'll share the gospel. And we pray, God, that you would draw people to Christ and that people would be saved. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.